we would like to thank and acknowledge our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star Monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. Okay, now um, our speaker for today is a senior research scientist and senior education and communication specialist at the Planetary Science Institute, as well as an associate research professor of science education at the University of Arizona. Her research could be very broadly summarized as learning about learning. And she's published quite a few papers in the field of astronomy education research on topics such as quantitative and scientific literacy, student knowledge and motivation, research experiences and STEM settings, and the outcomes of free choice learning environments. Today, she will be sharing with us her expert perspective on amateur astronomy, from volunteering and outreach to how the field has responded to coronavirus lockdowns worldwide. If you are interested in outreach, your brain is going to be just buzzing by the end of this webinar. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce Dr. Sandlin Buxner. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, I am hoping that everyone will actively participate in the chat and um, I love having, um, a conversation kind of going while I'm talking, that's totally fine. And so I will do my best to look at the chat uh, while we're going, but let me go ahead and share my slides. And I'm gonna look at Lauren to make sure that, uh, give me a thumbs up that everything looks good. Um, and so nice to see people uh, from all over the world. Um, and so I'll just introduce myself. Uh, today, I'm gonna be talking about um, an ongoing project that we are working on that is really all about amateur astronomers. And um, it'll be pretty clear why we picked the, uh, pick the title uh, in a little bit, but I'll just tell you a little bit about myself so you understand kind of why I do this. Um, and so again, I work at the Planetary Science Institute. My field is in research about scientists. And so I do a lot of public engagement work. And I also study people who do science and study people um, who do outreach. Uh, that's a lot of things. I also work at the University of Arizona in our College of Education, uh, really looking in a department of teaching, learning, and sociocultural studies. And so I look a lot at learning um, with focus in free choice learning environments, um, people who do things because they like it, not because they have to. That's what I'm really interested in. And then all the things I've sprinkled across the bottom are volunteer work I do, but it also helps uh, inform a lot of the things I care about. So I'm on the editorial board for the new Astronomy Education Journal. If you didn't know about this journal, I really want to highlight it. It's a new journal uh, coming out of the International Astronomical Union, and we are very interested in a broad range of topics from education research to innovations. And so we're just about to put our very first issue out. And so if you have any questions about publishing in that or it's all free access, please reach out to me. Um, I'll have my email for you. Um, I volunteer with Sky, Sky and Telescope to do an Astro 101. And we're gonna be doing partnering with Astro 101 High School Astronomy. Um, and so again, if you teach astronomy or even take astronomy um, and you're interested in this initiative, it's through the American Astronomical Society, um, please reach out. I'm on the executive committee for education for um, the AGU, the American Geophysical Union. Again, uh, very interested in education projects. I am the uh, education outreach officer um, for the division for planetary sciences. So I do a lot of work in that. And then I'm also on the executive committee for education for the American Astronomical Society. And so as you can see, 
um, a lot of my work is all about astronomy, working with professional astronomers, educators, and then amateur astronomers. And um, I myself and my husband are both amateur astronomers along with our daughters. What this work, kind of the impetus for this work is a new chapter we wrote, um, and I'll talk about the we, because this was certainly not myself, but uh, this book was just published uh, just a few months ago. And so it's uh, Space Science and Public Engagement. Um, Amy Kaminsky was the editor, and it's this great uh, new volume um, that you can see here, all the different chapters. The chapter I'm gonna be talking a lot about is chapter eight, um, which my co-authors and I, um, put together. And so this is actually the name of the chapter. Um, and here are my two co-authors. So Michael Fitzgerald, um, who is in Australia, and Rachel Freed, who I suspect many of you may know, um, who is very active um, in not only amateur astronomy, uh, robotic telescopes, things like that. And so we um, did a lot of work to put this together. What we did uh, to put the chapter together, and then a lot of the work that we were doing is uh, we were able to do interviews, whether it was uh, phone, Zoom, email interviews uh, with 53 individuals, um, many of whom who lived in the United States. We also talked to people um, from several different countries, um, Australia, Japan, Tunisia, Portugal, Indonesia, Cameroon, Nicaragua, and Botswana. Um, and many of those were facilitated through um, the IAU connections. I'm super grateful for everything that they helped us with. In addition to talking to amateurs, we talked to many people who support amateur astronomers. And so, um, you can see some of them, so Night Sky Network, um, International Dark Sky Association, obviously, uh, AVSO, IAU, the Astronomical League. And what we were trying to do was get a really good feel for amateur astronomy in 2020. And it just so happened that this happened during the pandemic. It was a fascinating time to be doing this work, and I'll be talking a little about that. But uh, I have to say that this was probably one of the most inspiring projects I've ever done because when I talk to people about astronomy, um, they're so excited and so passionate. And so this was uh, really quite an incredible project to, to take on. When we think about amateur astronomers, or it's really hard, we think about it obviously um, in lots of different ways. One way to think about it is on a continuum, right? From consumers of astronomy to users, right? To producers. And um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is how we grappled with how to do justice to all the people we talked to um, and all the things that we learned. And so what I want you to think about first, right, is that we've classified them, right? So lots of people who've written about amateurs have actually um, categorized them in lots you know, amateurs, all of us, the amateurs, the people who are enthusiastic in, in some different ways. And so I'll just very briefly summarize, like um, uh, Martin, Martin and Marnie did this work where they said, um, those are people who do research, right? Enthusiasts who wanna learn and those who engage in observation with equipment. That's one way to think about it. Um, we could think about it um, from a continuum of recreational participants to scientific observers. Williams did his dissertation actually. Um, on amateur astronomers. Uh, Percy was thinking about just, you know what, whatever they are, they're united by this. They have interest and enthusiasm for astronomy. Um, and we think about them, as we think about amateur astronomers, as amazing volunteers. Another way that amateurs have been characterized um, is kind of in this idea of a pyramid. So this is kind of everyone in astronomy, but we were trying to think about like how many folks might there be. Um, and this work was done, um, you know, around 2000, thinking about we know that there are a couple hundred thousand people with a casual interest, and then maybe they get some equipment or they start really thinking about it. So the tens of thousands in um, our novice, and then we start thinking about experienced amateurs, folks who've really taken this up, are really knowledgeable, have equipment, and do observing. Um, our masters, right, the folks who are doing a lot of the work, I think that many of you might do as, at the AABS. So, um, you know, taking measurements, uh, participating in science, um, and then all the way up to our professional astronomers. So that's some way we've thought about it. And we reconceptualized how to think about um, amateur astronomy. But what I want to start with, and I'm hoping that I can get 
you to participate in the chat with me is, do you identify as an amateur astronomer? Maybe you're a professional astronomer. Maybe you came just because you like astronomy. And so I'm really curious to have you use the chat um, to just share if you consider yourself an amateur astronomer, you identify that way. Um, and briefly, right? just saying why. So you could say, yes, uh, because I have a telescope that I take out every night, or yes, um, because I am a member of a club. I'm just really curious. Um, and this is all part of the work that we're doing. And since I have um, a couple dozen of you, I would love to hear from you. And if you don't, that's totally fine as well. Great question, uh, Michael. So this is uh, very, it's very US centric, but we do have some data. I will not say it's worldwide. So we have some data from other countries, but that's actually something I'll talk about as part of our future work. So that's a really great question. Oh my goodness. So we have someone who is a member of clubs and has their own backyard observatory. Right, local amateur astronomy club. Yep. Right, someone who does outreach, have telescopes, observe. Using right a remote site. Oh my goodness. Wonderful. And feel free to keep chatting. Uh, I have the chat up so I can, as it's coming through, um, I'll be happy to keep answering questions. And so the way we characterized um, amateur astronomers um, for this particular chapter, and you can critique it and I will take it and love it, um, is in these three ways, which I will uh, described briefly. So independent explorers, outreach agents, and researchers. And so that seemed to be very productive in the way we were thinking about it. But I'll give you a chance to tell us that we totally got it wrong. Um, and maybe we can do it in a different way. Um, what a really great question, Phil. I will put my email in the chat at the end uh, so it doesn't get lost and I'm happy to, uh, happy to chat. Okay, so here we go. This again is just a very brief overview. Um, if those of you are interested in actually reading the chapter, please just reach out to me. Um, so as we think about independent explorers, this is a huge, huge range um, of individuals, right? So we as independent explorers are consuming information because we love astronomy. We have an intrinsic motivation to learn more. And so this is everyone from who we might consider to be an armchair astronomer. I am not gonna stay up late. I just want to watch NOVA. I want to go to the public lecture. I want to talk to people about astronomy. My social network is about astronomy, right? Um, and right, so we have that on one side. I just really think astronomy is cool, right? And then there might be people who go a little bit farther. They might take classes at the community college or at the university, um, right? And then we keep going. We have people who are like, I'm going to get a telescope. I'm going to borrow a telescope. Um, I'm going to go to star parties. I'm going to I'm going to go for it all the way to people who are like, this is so cool that I am going to start taking my own images, maybe do some spectroscopy, or in fact, even make my own telescope. And um, and so I've kind of put the range along the bottom, right? People who might just go to the public lecture series, people who go to huge star parties and are enthusiastic. You might do a Messier marathon. You might actually grind um, your own mirror. But the thing that really we thought about as independent explorers is people who do it for themselves. I don't care if anyone sees this picture, I might share it, um, but I just love astronomy. And so this is a lot of people, right, in amateur astronomy. And we might imagine that this is kind of part of the base of a, a pyramid when we think about it. Then we're thinking about outreach agents. You love astronomy and you wanna share it with other people. You love to speak perhaps where you just think, man, I have an obligation to make sure that other people understand how amazing astronomy is. And so often these are members of the public whose interest was sparked and now you're giving back. Um, you might be doing a star party. You might be doing um, 
Sidewalk astronomy, take out your telescope and just grab people at the mall. You're giving public talks, you're going to schools, you're giving workshops to share your knowledge. Um, you're mentoring students to do different things. But again, the thing that we think about as an outreach agent is that someone who is sharing their passion, knowledge, skills with others. Um, I could talk for probably 12 hours about just all the different outreach things that we know about. I'm only gonna highlight just two. Um, one is PopScope, a really fun thing um, that we learned about where, right, it's sidewalk astronomy, but in urban locations, right? And so one of these things where really trying to bring astronomy to places that really don't have an opportunity. Again, we could talk about so many star parties and um, observations, but I just wanna just, use that as one example. The other is the solar system ambassadors. And the reason I chose to use this example is that very few, um, when I talked to Kay Ferrari about less than maybe 10% of the solar system ambassadors um, are observers, right? And so I, I like to break the idea that you have to look through a telescope or bring a telescope to do astronomy outreach, right? These are individuals who live in communities, are well-connected. And I suspect at least one solar system ambassador here um, very enthusiastic. And so they're doing this amazing outreach. Um, and when I talked to Kay last year, they had supported over 50,000 events. Um, and so there are so many examples, like I said, we could talk about it. And I would love to hear about all the types of outreach that you do as well. Um, I love learning about this. Um, I myself participate in a lot of this work, both in my professional life and my volunteer life. Um, and so this is something that is near and dear to my heart, but I think is really important when I talk to other people about what amateur astronomy is about. Um, and then we're gonna get into the domain that many of you are experts in. And this is amateurs as researchers. And so even though we know um, that amateurs have supported scientific research uh, for over hundred years, right? And including the AVSO um, in this, really, you know, in the 1990s as CCD technology got better, boy, it has blown up. And so the way we think about amateurs as researchers um, is this idea that um, individuals who are contributing to science, that they're sharing and discussing results. So as opposed to an independent explorer um, that just does it for their own knowledge, they're, they're not really going to put it out. These are individuals who are going to share it, talk about it, maybe with scientists, maybe with other amateurs, but often, um, again, contributing to knowledge, um, doing all sorts of imaging, um, photometry, spectroscopy. And one of the things that I think is the most amazing thing, and I am so thrilled um, that Voice Astro is um, one of the sponsors of this because they, we, we chatted with them and they do amazing work of increasing participation in research by students. And I think that's really one of the incredible thing is that um, astronomy as research is one of the things that we're seeing that really spanned generations um, across that. I also wanna call out SAS, very enthusiastic group of individuals um, who are doing work. Um, again, lots of work. You know, we got binaries, we have all sorts of stars, right? All sorts of planets, all sorts of work that's being done um, by that. And then of course, um, we have to talk about, we talk about this in the chapter, of course, the Pro-Am collaboration. So this is really, um, scientists may put out a call. So like the PACA project um, puts out a call saying, gosh, I, we need some observations. Obviously, a new project that I'm sure many of you are aware of, um, Exoplanet Watch, um, where we'll be doing backyard uh, observations to help with exoplanets. What an amazing citizen science project. And of course, all the work of the AVSO being um, this bridge to helping uh, many individuals contribute again to science um, in really special and important ways that, frankly, only amateurs can do. And one of the things that we talk a lot about is that amateur astronomers um, are the backbone of the kind of work that needs to be done because there's a lot more of us and we're enthusiastic and we have time and um, we want to contribute. And so one of the things, right, is that there is no continuum here, right? And so this is a very complex way to think about it. And so, you know, we don't put any, usually any person into just one bin. We really think about them as kind of um, an ecosystem. Right? And I suspect many of us um, sit in all these little intersections between an independent explorer, an outreach agent, or a researcher. And so I've certainly talked long enough um, at this moment, and I just wanted to take an opportunity um, to let you tell me how well we did. 
And so I wanna see where you see yourself. If you see yourself as an independent explorer, an outreach agent, a researcher, or we totally missed it and you're still an amateur astronomer, but we didn't capture the kind of work or your passion, um, very curious to hear about that. Yay, Michelle, so nice to see you. Give everyone another minute just to just to give me some. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love seeing all of the work that all of you do. This actually makes me incredibly happy. And oh, so great. Um, what I want to do now, I want to highlight, we talked to lots of people and I wish we could have talked to a thousand people. I just want to highlight um, some of the young amateur astronomers that we talked to, and that's going to lead into some work I want to discuss, which is about um, diversity. And so I'm just going to talk about it. A couple of them are actually AVSO members. I am going to have to read it because my, uh, my memory is not terrific. And so I'm just going to tell you about some of our wonderful amateurs that we were able to highlight um, in our chapter. And so we were really excited. And so the first, uh, Ryan Caputo, he is a young avid uh, avid amateur astronomer. Um, he is now in college. He became involved in astronomy at the age of 16 because he took a course um, at the Center for Talented Youth at Johns Hopkins Uni University. And he was so inspired, he pulled out his two and a half inch reflecting telescope that he'd never used and started peering in the night sky. Then he got a 10 inch daub for his birthday and then spent every clear night outside with it. And so he has spent considerable time observing and finding fainter objects. Uh, and then he was a sophomore. He took an astronomy research course when he was a sophomore. And um, he has worked with the Fairborn Institute Robotic Observatory to help develop a training module manual on how to do speckle interferometry on close double stars with the Vero telescope. And this image he took of the bubble nebula was taken the night before he left for college. Um, and it was posted on his Astro Bin site. And in his description, he said, this is the last photo from me for a while. I'm headed to college um, tomorrow. I won't be taking my telescope with me. Um, but, so super excited um, about Ryan's work and he still continues to do this. The next is uh, actually someone who is very, uh, very plugged into the AVSO. Uh, so Molly is currently a PhD student in physics at the University of California, Berkeley. And again, been interested in astronomy from a young age. Um, she fed her interest with books and TV shows. So again, as an independent explorer, and then she was given a telescope. And so she started to make observations of the night sky. And after seeing Saturn, as many people are, she was hooked. Um, she joined her local astronomy club um, and her older members gave her gear and supported her. And she got into astrophotography. She gets lots of great satisfaction from her astrophotography. You can see a version of this right here, which is amazing and beautiful, but she is also a very active outreach agent. Um, and so she writes blogs, uh, she goes to star parties, other big events, works with the scouts, and uh, she owns now five telescopes and a pair of binoculars. Um, and she gets a lot of attention because she's a young woman um, in astronomy. She also is an active member of the AVSO and Exoplanet Watch and is an Explorer Alliance ambassador. And so her passion is really diversifying the field um, of amateur astronomy. And so she basically has lots of roles, right? Many of these, all three of these roles as we think about um, the kinds of work she's doing as an amateur. Uh, the next, um, 
his interests. He is the current chair of the Jakarta Amateur Astronomy Club, um, and he has loved the stars since he was very young. He joined the club when he was 16 years old, but he doesn't own a telescope. And so we wanted to include him to show how very active you can be um, as an amateur astronomer without owning your own telescope. And so his club gives him the opportunity to use the telescope. That was the very first time he actually got to use a telescope. Um, in high school, he sketched images of Venus um, and got to participate very actively in the International Year of Astronomy. Um, he works across Indonesia to develop a national network for the future of astronomy development. Um, very active in outreach, um, does many events. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, they've started taking their, their club uh, meetings virtually, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And then the last, I really want to highlight Lauren, my wonderful host. I was so thrilled. Um, actually to get to talk to Lauren um, as part of this book. And so Lauren, now 20 years old, right? Another one of our young amateur astronomers. Um, she developed when she got a toy telescope from a family friend. And so her mom, who is her best supporter of all this, um, encouraged her, she started going to her local astronomy club meetings and star parties, um, getting her passion. But she was quite young, right? She was the youngest member. And so it was hard to be accepted. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, she got, right, she persevered. Maybe she didn't get as much support as she wanted. And um, she he has kept observing ever since. And she teaches lots of people um, about the night sky. She does a lot of outreach events. And she has been in love with Spectra. And I know some of you have probably even gone to her workshops since she was reading a book about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, and so she got to go to a spectroscopy workshop and she is hooked. And uh, she now works with the AAVSO in presenting community workshops and uh, super excited um, that she's my host today. And so again, I could do probably a wonderful uh, bio on many of you. We'll talk about some work we'd like to do maybe to get to do that. Um, in the chapter, uh, we certainly don't have time uh, to go through it, is supporting organizations. Um, I think many of these organizations, whether they are for profit or not, know that there are lots and lots and lots of amateur astronomers. And so when we think about it, it's somewhere between hundreds of thousands and millions of people who engage in amateur astronomy in the world. And so these, um, these kind of umbrella organizations, we might have clubs, many people have local clubs, regional clubs, there are societies and their associations, depending on what we call it, depending on what part of the world you're in. We have these umbrella organizations, many of which I put across the bottom, things like the Night Sky Network. So if you have a club, um, you might be a member of the Night Sky Network. They provide um, ways to do club membership, lots of great support. If you don't know about them, you should. Um, obviously, the International Dark Sky Association, which happens to be headquartered here in Tucson, um, the International Astronomical Union, the Astronomical League, which again um, has both individual members and club members, does the Reflector Magazine, does a lot of great stuff. Astronomers Without Borders, which helps coordinate and do outreach all over the world. Obviously, the AAVSO, um, some of the magazines, so both Astronomy Magazine and Sky and Telescope are very, very interested in supporting amateurs, telling stories, all of that. And so again, if you're interested in more of that, I think uh, many of you live this, um, you, can, you can contact me and I'm happy to chat. But what I really wanna talk about, one of the things that was fascinating about doing this work was what happened during the COVID pandemic. And so uh, last March, um, many of us had events. Um, I was gonna get on an airplane and go do an event. And of course, um, we all shut down for safety reasons. And so when we think about what happened, many of us were pivoting to think about, oh my goodness, we can't have uh, that star party. Uh, we can't have that festival. We can't have whatever. And as we started to shut down, an amazing amount of innovation occurred. And when I started talking to people, uh, it was in June of the pandemic. And so I learned about amazing types of innovations. A little bit I want to share with you. Um, so monthly club events went online, right? And so we, right, people started to learn to use Zoom or Facebook Live or YouTube Live. And so we started to see that we could still meet. We were just gonna be meeting electronically. There was probably a little bit of a learning curve as I talked to many people about this. Um, but here's a picture of actually my, my hometown astronomy club, the TAAA. Um, and uh, the um, Amateur Astronomer Association of New York, who we did um, interview for our chapter, uh, that they all started doing things online. And so not only their clubs, but like this webinar and their talks and their trainings, and an amazing thing happened. 
more people started to be able to contribute. So if you had people who had families and they couldn't come because it was dinner time, now they started to tune in. Or you had people who may not have great mobility and didn't want to park. We started to see a lot more participation. Now, right, I can give a talk to somebody all the way across the country or the world. We don't have to worry about carbon footprint, getting on a plane, all of that. And so, right, it's kind of an obvious thing, but this idea of things started to go online and it started to increase what we can do. In addition, right, couldn't get together for star parties. And so star parties go online. And again, we're seeing some really large rousing star parties um, going on, right? Where the Mount Burnett Observatory actually had a huge star party down in Australia. Um, you know, we're talking about thousands of people contributing. And so we're very excited um, about the types of events that again are letting people who might be in star polluted sites aren't anywhere near you. They want to take a look um, and see what's going on. And it's a great way to connect people across the world. Here's another uh, picture of um, Explore Scientific uh, hosted by Scott Roberts and David Levy. And so they've been going strong as many others have. Um, and again, I suspect many of you are hosting star parties. Um, we've gotten more virtual uh, viewing opportunities. So again, we have our conjunction, we have new equipment coming on the market that again, we can be using, right? Our iPhone to be projecting. And so this is something that's great for schools. It's great for Girl Scouts. It's great for all of us as we think about sharing the sky with others. Conference attendance has really been interesting. And so, uh, you know, we found out, right, that last year's AVSO conference was huge because you could attend virtually um, the ASP conference, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. We had a huge turnout. Um, this is true um, in both professional but then amateur astronomers. We are starting to go back uh, in person, many of us and many of our conferences. And so one of the things that we're starting to think about is how do we keep a lot of what we got in increased participation when we start to go back in person. Lots more virtual field trips. Virtual field trips aren't new, but it was something that outreach, right, became a really great vehicle for outreach that many of us can use. So we had um, lots of different tours um, and people are giving tours of their observatories, giving tours of the night sky. And that's really blown up in these virtual field trips for outreach. Um, and then one of the things I've been super excited is watching the leverage and collaboration of amateur astronomers, outreach professionals who are getting to partner with other virtual events at nature centers, performing arts centers and school visits, again, in ways they never could before, right? There weren't buses, there weren't um, ways to get there. And so getting astronomy into other places it had never been um, has been really exciting to watch. Um, Non-virtual events, this was really cool to talk to people about. What do we do if we wanna do something live? And so we saw lots of innovation. Some of it is documented in the Night Sky Network. Some of it's documented with um, solar system ambassadors. Some is just talking to people. And so just a few examples. I would love to hear about any of your examples of how you adapted to doing outreach during COVID. Um, this idea of bring your own binocular or telescope events in a large field and stay really far apart while somebody narrates and points things out. Um, neighborhood solar system walks, uh, rover sketches, um, sidewalk science outreach, just people coming and right, helping people through the pandemic when they were stuck not being able to go places. And then of course, citizen science, which has been very popular and remote telescopes has blown up again. And so getting to um, participate in citizen science, lots of people are at home wanting to contribute, wanting to be a part of something bigger. We have noticed uh, a lot of this really blowing up the use of robotic telescopes, not just for research, just for fun. Um, and then of course, we hear from lots of vendors uh, that telescope and equipment sales, I can't Tell you one vendor I talked to who didn't tell me that everything on sales went up, not just introductory equipment, but people just saying, you know what, I now have time, I'm at home, I am really, I'm going to go for it, I'm going to get a new camera, I'm going to upgrade my equipment. And so when we think about innovations that are here to stay so far, and again, I'd love to hear from you, um, astronomy outreach is not slowing down, it's changing format a little, but it is huge. We've heard that the interest in astronomy 
um, just increases as people are stuck at home. And so one of the things I like to think about as I talk to different groups is we have the potential to reach more people and new audiences from anywhere in the world and we shouldn't lose that. We figured it out and we should leverage that to continue webcasting talks, to continue collaborations across the world because it has been really positive. I mean, so we like to say that interest in astronomy is really, really high, accessibility is increased. Um, let's continue all of that. One thing I wanna talk briefly about, uh, and we'll talk about some future work is the demographics of amateur astronomy. And so in Western countries, and this really gets back to the point, we know from studies, there are not very many, that um, amateur astronomers are largely Caucasian male. Um, they're well-educated and they have significant disposable incomes because of equipment. And again, I can't say I have tons of research to back this up. This is something we need to work on. So there was a recent survey um, by the Night Sky Network uh, that talked about those respondents who were um, actually over 50 years of age and 84% were male. And then a couple studies of hobbyists have also shown that they're fairly skewed towards male and older individuals um, and well-educated, right? Not to say that's everyone, but that's something that we're characterizing and we probably need more. Uh, the study of hobbyists showed it wasn't just amateur astronomy, it was hobbies in general. And some of the things they talked about was that uh, older individuals have more time, they have more money, right? They have more access. So this is something I think um, as we are members of clubs and leaders in clubs and organizations want to think about. There's also some reported barriers to participation in am amateur astronomy that I think everyone should be aware of. And so the study by Corwin et al. Um, really looked at uh, women tend to participate less in observing in clubs because of their concerns about personal safety. It's dark, it might be out in the middle of nowhere, and that's something we should all be really aware of. Um, lots of people might have postponed hobby development because they had kids or they have to work a lot at their job or they are not in a location where they can go. Um, there might be reduced social contact because you're the only person who looks like you at a club. Um, makes people feel really isolated. Um, there might be a lack of access because you're in an urban environment and you have a lot of light pollution. And there might be some prohibitive costs if you believe you have to have a telescope to participate in astronomy. And I like to think about all of these as opportunities. What are the opportunities that are posing themselves to help us address it? And so in this study, uh, they did interview some folks to say, well, how could we increase ethnic um, and racial diversity? And so some of the things that these individuals said is engage young students, right? Many people do. I'm um, using natural uh, students, children's national curiosity. Um, get rid of those misconceptions about minority participation that it is for everyone and really creating hobby spaces that are comfortable and welcoming uh, to people we don't see. And so again, I consider that to be an opportunity that we can work on. Um, intentional use and celebration of role models of individuals that again, we aren't seeing. Um, and really actively attending to safety concerns in observing conditions. And the beautiful thing that we saw was many clubs and institutions, including the AAVSO, um, are already actively taking this on. Um, bringing in ambassadors of younger individuals, trying to really do some outreach. And so it's, like I said, a call to all of us to continue this, but I think we need to be talking about it and researching it more. And so I'm, what I wanna end with, right, is this idea that we really have a bright future in amateur astronomy because um, all of us, all of you, uh, provide valid, reliable, and consistent observations. They're of high value to the astronomy community. Often when we talk about amateur astronomers, um, some people think that there is this tension between amateurs and professionals. And in fact, sometimes when we talk to professionals, they're like, Ooh, I don't know if I wanna take observations, right? From someone who uh, isn't in, in the field as it were. But one of the things that we've shown and many professionals who work through pro-am collaborations have shown is that um, the data provided by amateur astronomers um, is outstanding um, and is high value. Um, one thing that the president of SAS always brings up is that these large surveys like Rubin Observatory coming online very soon, they're going to need follow-up observations. And there are not enough professional astronomers in the world, time, money, access, to be able to do the follow-ups. And so as we have more NASA missions, as we have more large observatories, amateur astronomers are, uh, it's not 
good to have there essential for the kinds of work that professional astronomy really wants to do. And of course, um, we all make up right this army of knowledgeable, enthusiastic volunteers um, who have real connections to community. So unlike someone who comes in and gives a talk and might leave, they might be famous. Um, amateur astronomers are incredibly valuable in the fact that we are embedded in communities that we care about. Uh, this work is very important to all of us. Um, and we're going to stick around and, and really kind of continue on. Okay. And then just thinking about future work for understanding the amateurs, um, just letting you know uh, what we're doing, but I would love to hear. Um, we really uh, are starting collaboration with the IU about understanding international amateur astronomers. Um, many of the individuals we talked to, again, were actually outside the US um, and were amazing. And I feel like it was just the tip of the iceberg. And so we're gonna be working with the IAU um, to do that. Um, obviously, um, Astronomers Without Borders, another really, really great organization when we're thinking about that. Um, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific will be rolling out a new survey of US clubs. I highly um, encourage you to take that survey so they can really understand amateur astronomy. That will only be for the United States. Um, and we are working on uh, some new publications or projects about having all of the amateurs tell their own stories. So instead of me coming in and telling a story for you. I'm really having an outlet for people to tell their own stories. And so that's the kind of work that we're gonna be working on, but I would be really interested to hear about the kind of work you would be interested in seeing about amateur astronomy, because um, that might help drive the kind of work that we're doing in the future. And with that, uh, that is my email. I am gonna put my email into chat as well. And I just want to thank you for joining me. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Buxner. That was great. So looks like we've got a question here in the Q&A from um, Michelle Wooten. Actually, a couple of different questions. So uh, Michelle asked, the book uh, that your chapter is in is titled with space science rather than astronomy. Is there such a thing as amateur space scientists? And uh, do you think that there is a meaningful difference discipline wise when talking about amateurs in astronomy versus space science? I'm reading your question, Michelle. <laughs> uh, wondering how to navigate those discipline, trying to learn more about amateur. Okay, so I'll start with that. So um, part of the reason the chapters in space science was, um, as you can guess, political, because that particular volume happened to be all about space science. And so it wasn't, right, it was about Mars. And so, as you know, Michelle and I are colleagues, right, that um, there is this kind of divide. Um, but I think functionally, it is to me the same thing, right? So I think amateur astronomers and amateur space scientists, we could think about um, whether we have people doing some exploration, but to me, they are functionally the same. Um, but I, I am correct that I, when I see the studies of amateur astronomers, it's really an astro. Like we don't see too much in space science. So that's that's a nice. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, do I learn about any group that's helped get the city or local university implementing? Oh, planning a large local telescope observatory. Yeah, actually, um, I can tell you that the group in Australia that I worked uh, with. Um, was really working with their uh, city and local observatory to invest in these large um, observatories. I also talked to someone in the Midwest um, who's a very active amateur astronomer um, and um, was also trying to convince the university that he could put that telescope on their property and everyone would win because the students could use it as well as the amateurs. One of the things um, that when I talked to several individuals, Andy Fracknoy, who some of you may know, he is super passionate about amateurs supporting students. And he really believes that one of the things that we could do to really help education is foster that. And so there've been different pro uh, projects like Project Astro, um, but he really wants to see um, a very structured program that lets amateurs support students because there's just not again enough professionals who have time and there are lots of amateurs who are amazing not only outreach but educators um and so that's a really great question um Thanks. barbara says um, i'd like to see a oh yeah so sorry 
I just I just wanted to go ahead and uh, make sure that to get on the recording, uh, I'm going to read out the question you just answered from Michelle, which Perfect. was, uh, did you learn about any group of amateur astronomers that helped get their city or local university to invest in the planting of a local large telescope or observatory? And you just answered that. So go ahead. And if you want to read out Perfect. Dr. Harris's so, question, you can. Yeah, Barbara said, I would like to see a hybrid of virtual and in-person meetings and star parties. I think it will go a long way to encourage women, younger people, and minorities to get involved. And I 100% agree, Barbara, because again, one of the things that we noticed is I, I could go to a star party. I have two young children. I have a three-year-old who must go to bed or she is a total lunatic and nobody wants her running around the observatory. And so um, when she gets to... Um, check it out, put her jammies on. It makes it so much easier because I used to bring my kids to star parties and ooh, that was really, that was really mm -hmm. something. So I 100% agree that that would be really great. Oh, okay. So Patrick, I also, um, and I'll be curious, astrotourism. So Patrick says, what do I think of astrotourism as an outreach option? I actually think that astrotourism, um, when it is done in a way that, um, well, I think it's awesome, right? So again, when I think of astrotourism, I think about going different places, like even coming here, say, to Mount Lemon to have a night overnight. Now, um, sometimes I worry a little bit about uh, different communities um, and supporting communities, perhaps in like Namibia, but I think it's a fantastic outreach option. Um, and I would love to hear more about that because I just think it's so great um, getting people super excited. On another note, I also think that um, it makes great money for observatories. So I think that's a really great option. Okay, I'm going to go back. Um, is there any, I'm going to have you clarify a little bit, Chitra. Is there any scope to naked eye astronomy? And I'm going to have you clarify that just so I can make sure I understand your question. And I'm going to go back to this one. Um, is there a central resource uh, where amateurs can explore what volunteer opportunities exist to support professional projects? I feel fortunate that I happen to be in webinars like this to learn about individual opportunities like tests, Exoplanet Watch, um, S News, et cetera. If it doesn't exist, does it make sense to have a broker-like website? Yes, where professionals can request and be connected to um, amateurs with capability and interest. And I think that is also a fantastic question. As of right now, there is no central place, right? So um, in fact, the AVSO is a really fantastic place that's brokering a lot of these, but I would say there isn't. And so you just gave me a really great um, thing to, to bring to the community. Um, because I think that's such a fantastic, um, a fantastic idea to have a place where they <laughs> can find you. Because again, we kind of had to collect and I had to ask some people and say, well, what do you participate in? So I think that's just a fantastic suggestion. Um, if someone does know of that site, please let us know because it's not well advertised. Um, we haven't <laughs> been able to find it, so. Yeah, that does sound like an excellent idea. I don't know of a site like that, just, um, just, the AAVSO's um, alert notice page. And I think there's a database of high priority targets. And that's mostly, I think, coming from uh, individual uh, professional astronomers who are requesting data or small teams. The large programs like the listed ones, uh, TESS, Exoplanet Watch, Snooze, those, as far as I know, don't have actual AAVSO alert notices out. So I think it would be awesome if someone out there would create a resource where you could learn about what are the professional programs that need observations. Great, Charles, go ahead and uh, drop me your, you can just drop me your email, that'd be fantastic. Because I mean, a really good example is PACA, um, which is only on Facebook, right? Like you have to be on Facebook to see it. And again, it's kind of a word of mouth thing, but even when I was going and trying to find individuals, they were kind of all over the place. So I think that's just really a, a fantastic suggestion. Could you remind us what PACA is? Um, it's the uh, it's the one run. Um, I'm gonna get it wrong. Let me let me look it up really quick because I will <laughs> get it wrong. It's uh, all about. Let's see. Let me go back. It's the one run by Padma Fisher. Um, we'll keep going. There it is. 
Um, oh, good. We'll just go check it out. It'll be great. Oh yes, the Pro-Am Collaborative Astronomy Project. That's why it was just like, it was enough generic to, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, but, but Padma who is at the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, basically gets different campaigns. She works for NASA and basically a lot of times has people doing comet observations and things like that. So, but the only way to basically get into that project is through her connections, connecting with her on Facebook. And so that's, it's kind of an important thing for, for folks. Interesting. Good to know. Um, just FYI, I think your screen share is uh, frozen. frozen. Let me just stop that. And we'll just talk. Because okay. again, for anyone who is still with us, I would love, I would love to know the types of things that you think would be really cool for people to study about amateurs or to characterize about amateurs or to know. And like I said, there is very little literature um, in um, kind of anywhere. There's some evaluation reports, but I think that really understanding, you know, the folks who are really passionate about astronomy, who are volunteers, um, is something that would be really great. And so, um, yeah. So if you have ideas that we haven't thought of, I'm really open to that. Uh, while people are typing in their ideas, hopefully, I have a question actually, um, just based on something that I have noticed through being a member of astronomy clubs is that it seems like many or most uh, of the active amateur astronomers in at least the clubs that I have participated in um, kind of are intimidated or scared by the more advanced um, citizen science stuff that I think a lot of the current members of the audience do, photometry, that kind of thing. I mean, I was I was very scared by that for a long time, uh, honestly, until this year when I was running this webinar series and we brought in some people to talk about photometry and I was like, that's it? <laughs> it's that easy? So, but no one ever, I noticed um, in these clubs I was a part of, no one ever tried to learn about it because it looked so scary. Is that something that you can uh, comment on? Do you have any tips for kind of getting the word out there that not only can you learn this, but it's not that hard? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to a different kind of outreach, right? The amateur to amateur outreach. And I suspect, right, having worked with, you know, been members of many clubs, that if someone like you were to reach out to your club and go, I would love to give a workshop on how to do that, that would go a really long way, right? Because what happens is we do a lot of things where we might go and give an informational session and say, be a part of Exoplanet Watch. This is all. And it's like, if you have somebody who's really excited and technologically savvy, they're going to do it. But I suspect that what we need to be doing is some workshops um, for the clubs so that they're getting that hands on, like, let's try it out right on Thursday night. So you can see it. And so they see that pathway um, and that they have a knowledgeable individual, um, maybe from this community, that's going to kind of mentor them. And as they, as they get going, right, then they're going to be excited. And I think that's another great way to also um, suck in some more high school students and college students to that as well, because um, they can kind of contribute. Absolutely. You got a very good point there. There's no substitute for a hands-on workshop. Okay. So it looks like uh, Chitra had just asked another question. Um, can you suggest any club or organization for uh, Chitra to work in a better way? So I think uh, Chitra had mentioned earlier that they do visual observing. And let's see, are you, let's see, do you, yeah, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have you email me and then we can work on figuring out where you live, right? And so we can get some resources close to you. Um, okay. So I'm gonna go back and forth. So Michelle said the Corwin study rec had recommended for increasing diversity is neat. Lauren, good. What do you think of your local own local astronomy club could have done to be more inviting to you? Um, and have we seen any US-based clubs that succeed in becoming more diverse? What did they do? So I'm going to have Lauren start and tell us. What do you think? Okay. Um, so 
the the main issue that I encountered when I was getting into astronomy was just that I was a 13 year old girl and no one you know I'd walk into the meeting room and no one would assume that I wasn't just there with my grandpa because you know I was staying with him at the time right I was actually the one interested in astronomy and so it was difficult to get people to take me seriously because why would a 13 year old girl know anything about astronomy so I don't really know how you can make an uh, like an entire astronomy club just more receptive to the idea beyond just you know as more young women get involved in astronomy it's going to become more normalized the idea that hey we look at the stars too <laughs> we like it so I, unfortunately i don't really know that i have a suggestion i can just say that the the difficulties that i encountered were based on people just simply weren't expecting that they would be able to hold a conversation with astronomy about astronomy with me and so i had difficulty starting those conversations <laughs> yeah, that's i think that's super important and and michelle one of the things i saw um Again, this um, observatory in Australia actually has an amazing amount of young people. And part of it was going out and recruiting young people mm -hmm. and saying, we want you to be here um, doing things at a time that someone who is 13 can do it, which is not nine o'clock at night. I mean, just having some events, doing more outreach events, inviting people, that seems to be what has been successful. Um, there are clubs that are really diversifying. Clearly there are clubs in urban areas that are very diverse. And so again, when we take a look at this broad Right, I'm gonna say stereotype of who amateur astronomers are. That is not to say every club is that way or every amateur astronomer is that way. It's just when we look at the studies of hobbyists, that's really what we're seeing. Um, okay, yeah, so having women in, in places of, um, places of uh, leadership, I think is also important. Michael said, I would like to know about astronomy experiences from areas other than the US and Western Europe, and I would too. And so that's uh, one of those things that we're gonna be actively doing, so I'm really, I'm really glad because we're interested. Obviously, we we have if we think you you know amateur astronomers are understudied in the United States, they're understudied as in not understood at all um, across the world. And again, as I talked to people, they were doing unbelievable outreach to unbelievable numbers of people, right? And so that to me, uh, by the time I started getting into those, we had to publish this chapter and we did not have a chance and they didn't let me have any more words. I could have written probably a whole book. And that's part of what we really wanna do is have the voices of people all over the world who are amateurs speaking their own stories. And so that's something that I'm very passionate about. So that will be really great. Um, Patrick says, concerning Caucasian character of astronomy, um, as we are speaking right now, um, they have uh, a Congress headed to Tijuana, Mexico, being broadcast live through Latin America. Um, and they've been held now since Thursday with a huge success. And I am not familiar, so I'm really glad that you brought that to my attention. That's really great. I will check it out. Um, okay, I will finish up. Okay, and that does look like the end of the questions for now. I say we give it one more minute in case anyone's still typing, because I see that we've had some long ones coming through intermittently. And then if yeah. and no other questions. Like I said, I will put my email in here. And um, again, thank you for joining me for a talk that's probably fairly different than what um, what you normally see. And so I'm excited. Um, I'm excited to share back. Uh, part of part of why we did this is because we had such great participation from members of the AVSO um, for our chapter. We definitely wanted to make sure to share back the things that we found um, with everyone, like Lauren um, and Stella and everyone else. Thank you. It was different, but it's also extremely valuable. This good information and stuff that we should all be keeping in mind um, as we're going out there and we're doing outreach. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put up our end screen here. Okay, and uh, to close out this webinar, I would like to extend a huge and heartfelt thank you to Dr. Buxner for sharing her time and knowledge with us today. I would also like to uh, thank again our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night.
This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AADSO. Now, if you are currently sitting there in your office chair wishing that you could send today's talk out to your astronomy club's outreach group, you are in luck because today's webinar has been recorded and the recording will soon be available for free on the AAVSO's YouTube channel. You can find a full library of webinars just like this one there. So go check it out. And while you're there, please consider subscribing to our channel. Not only will you get a notification every time that we post a new educational video, but by hitting the little subscribe button, you will be making YouTube more likely to suggest our videos to others. It's like doing your own small form of outreach. <laughs> that is a uh, one more way that you can help support the AAVSO. Speaking of support, this webinar series is being supported by you, the viewer. So please, if you're not a member, join the AAVSO. AAVSO membership comes with a wide array of benefits, including free access to our mentorship program. So if you're wanting to learn how to observe variable stars with your own eyes and start contributing to science, our mentors can help. And as always, we would be so grateful if you would consider donating to the AAVSO. Every donation matters and goes towards making programs like this one come to life. 